So <laughs> you know that it's, that, that it's um, spring forward when after the pastoral prayer, the church is still half empty. Um, normally, uh, for, for, for those of you guys who are uh, new to the church, uh, no, no, normally the routine is um, at around 9.45, which is when service starts, we have about 15 people. And then at around 9.50, we have about you know, 25 people. And at around 9.55, we have about 40 people. And then at around 10 o'clock, which is like the magic time, we have like 150 people. And then, and then we pass like another five, 10 minutes. And then after the pastoral prayer, we're at around 2.50. So um, today I, I'm looking and we're, pro- we're probably pushing around uh, 150, which just tells me that the majority of us are just waking up now, which is okay. Um, we have an opportunity um, today uh, just uh, to, to, to receive the word of God. We are uh, finishing up our series on a covenantal family. And uh, today we're going to be looking at what it means to uh, learn together. So if you guys uh, pull open your Bibles, we're going to be in uh, Deuteronomy 6. Uh, We'll be there for uh, the entire duration um, of our time together. Um, If you guys have been at church for um, any length of time, um, you will realize that church is a place where you are asked uh, to do things. Right, uh, we, we, we just did a whole series on what you need to be uh, doing. You need to be serving, you need to be giving, you need to be uh, praying, you need to be uh, singing, you need to be, uh, there, there, there were a couple more. Um, but, but, but these were the things that you've been asked to do and, and you've been told that at church we are to um, participate in and to do um, these uh, things. And um, sometimes we get so caught up in in activity that we don't um, stop to ask ourselves, why am I doing all of this work? Like, why, why, why am I striving so hard? Why am I pursuing so hard? But what happens is that there's going to come a day where, um, where, where you will ask this question. Maybe that day has already come for some of you guys. You guys are just looking around and, and you're, and you're just, just plowing through and you're saying, you know, why am I here? Why do I come? Why do I read my Bible every um, day? Why, why do I pray? What's the point of all of this? And, and, and this is what um, God is addressing in our uh, passage. Um, to, to give you a little bit of um, context leading up to this, uh, he has just given the Israelites uh, the Ten Commandments uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And then in Deuteronomy chapter, in the beginning of chapter 6, he gives uh, the greatest command, which is uh, to love the Lord your God with all your uh, heart, soul, and strength. And then Reverend Ted preached on how uh, the Israelites were commanded to um, diligently pass down these commands to their children. And in addition to that, we see in our passage um, that they are to also explain to their children uh, why they needed to obey. So it's not simply a passing down of commandments. You know, you need to do this, need to do this, need to do this. But it's, you know, here's why. Here's why. And unfortunately, um, my, my, my preaching professor would lament this. Um, there is a trend in uh, churches today uh, where preachers and teachers are uh, getting really, really good at telling people uh, what to do and how to do it. But um, what we miss out on is um, informing us and teaching us and shaping us on why we are supposed to um, do and why we are supposed to serve, why we're supposed to obey. And since we're not addressing the why, churchgoers have mistaken Christianity as a list of thou shalt and thou shalt nots. And we end up with a lifeless religion as opposed to what Christianity ought to be, which is a a vibrant, living relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we cannot separate the giving of the commands with the reasons. It's just natural for us to ask. Um, God assumes that we're going to ask the question. If you just look at our passage, our first verse, in the future, when your son asks you, so there will come a day where you or someone around you will come up to you and say, why am I supposed to obey God? What is the point of all of this? And in that day, what you're going to do is you're going to direct that person or you're going to remind yourself to this passage and you're going to receive and remember the words that God gave to Moses to share with the Israelites and the words that he's given me uh, to share with uh, you. 
And the words are as follows. If in verse 21 we read, Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh and Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible, upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. So in the day where we are called to question, why am I going to obey? God says, what I want you to do is I want you to remember the time that I rescued you from slavery in Egypt. And I think most of us are familiar with this story, either from Sunday school or you watched one of two movies. If you're of a certain age, uh, the movie was The Ten Commandments starring Charlton Heaston. And uh, judging from uh, the looks, uh, many of you guys have no clue who he is. And so the movie for you was The Prince of Egypt. All right? it, it, it's animated, but it's the same thing. It's the same concept. Uh, the Israelites were enslaved, and God rescued them through spectacular demonstrations of his might, culminating with uh, the great escape, which is uh, where he parted the Red Sea, and the Israelites passed through the Red Sea and escaped Uh, the Egyptian army. And the Bible records that God did all of this because of his great love for the Israelites. If, uh, in Exodus 3, chapter 7, verse, uh, and, and chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, uh, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And what we need to catch is that God rescued the Israelites out of the land of Egypt and into the promised land because of his great love for them. And it was important for the Israelites to see that God had proven in the past that he was out for their good so that they would trust that his commandments are also for their good. And that if they obeyed, they would be blessed. When they were reminded of God's life-giving actions in the past, they would be able to see that his instructions were not oppressive, but that they were also life-giving. And now I just want to just take a slight detour. I know it's early. Just wanna, I just, just want to get some um, interaction just to see whether or not you are um, alive. Um, what, uh, what, what came first? Did, uh, the, did God save the Israelites and save them from slavery first, or did he give them the commandments first? See, save them from slavery right? And, and, and that's important. So, so, so next question, if that's the case, then <laughs> if that's the case, then were the Israelites saved because they obeyed the law or because God loved them? You, 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 you can say it. It's okay. It's okay. God loved them. God loved them. He saved them because he loved them. And, and this is Super important because one of the big mistakes that we have is that the Old Testament is about salvation by works and that the New Testament is about salvation by grace. But what we need to understand is that God has worked the same all the way through, that there has been nobody, nobody that has deserved salvation, not even the Israelites, and that God saved them purely because he loved them, not because they deserved it. And it's important to know this because then, because, and, and, you know, we weren't there. You know, we didn't walk past, we, we didn't walk through the Red Sea, but the Israelites were. You know, they were. And so they knew, you know, they, they knew as they were walking past, I didn't do anything. Did you do something? I didn't do something. Right? They knew that they were saved by grace. And so they knew that obedience to the law was not to attain God's acceptance, but rather it was to, uh, rather, obedience was based upon a trusting in God and a recognition that with obedience comes blessing. And that they were reminded that God's commands flowed from his deep love for them. Now, to bring it back to us, the Israelites uh, were called to remember uh, God's actions at the Red Sea, where he uh, definitively acted in human history to bring about salvation. Christians 
are called to remember God's actions on the cross, where he definitively acted in human history to bring about our salvation. See, it was on the cross where Jesus bore the, uh, bore the penalty of our sin and gave us the privileges of righteousness. Right? This is known as the great exchange where God, um, where, where we exchanged our sin and our filth and, our, and the penalty of our sin and we gave it to Jesus and Jesus took it and he bore the penalty of our sin, which was death on the cross. And what we got instead was we got his righteous life and the reward of righteousness, which is a relationship with God that stretches into eternity. The great exchange, right? Our sin for his righteousness, and 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 when some and, and and this is this this really struck me like I I I am a um I'm a worrier like to to the max, and and so whenever I get a cough I think that I'm gonna die, and, and it's just one of those things like I I've, I I I was a little short on breath uh, yesterday and so you know my my mind just went to you know I have lung cancer I have three months to live and you know it's it's going bad for me and you know what's gonna happen after these three months and and I'm just worrying and I'm just stressing and I, and 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 instantaneously the thought that came to my mind was after I die what's going to happen. You know, am I just going to cease to exist? And one of the greatest gifts that I think God has given us, oh, sorry, I, I didn't finish the story. Um, if, if, because if, if I will cease to exist, then everything I do now till the day I die will matter not. Will matter, will count for nothing. Because everything that I have done is going to culminate to absolutely nothing. That's just the book of Ecclesiastes. If you read it, everything is meaningless. And I think one of the greatest gifts that God has given you and me is eternity. Because what eternity means is that our life here matters and that your every action matters. Now there's a problem with him giving us eternity. And that's that we have all sinned and that the eternity that we are heading to is hell. But thanks be to God that he has loved us so much that he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross to bear our sins on our behalf so that this exchange can happen, so that we are not going to suffer the penalty for our sin, but we are instead going to receive the reward of righteousness, which is eternal life. And now your life here matters because your decision here matters. You have a choice to choose Christ and live or to reject him and live. But the question is, where are you going to be living the rest of your eternity? And when you question whether or not you should continue persevering in Christ, persevering in obedience to him and faith in him. We are called to remember eternity. We are called to remember that there is eternity. That our eternal destination apart from Christ and apart from God's mercy is hell. And we are also called to remember that God so loved you that he left the splendor of heaven to come to earth, to die on a cross, to die on a cross, that God would die. I, I, talked to a, I talked to a Muslim friend and he thought that this was the most insulting thing in the entire world, that God would die for mere humans. That's like us dying for ants. Because we so loved ants. And sometimes we esteem ourselves so highly 
I esteem myself so highly. I don't think of myself as an ant. But God, but God in comparison to us is like us and ants. And he loved us so much. And we are called to remind or to be reminded of the fact that God died for you. And the same God who died for you is the same God who is issuing these commandments, that the same love that compelled Christ to the cross is the same love that drives him to command you to obey. And and what I want to be clear on is this, that God does not call us to remember his faithfulness in order to guilt us into obeying him. See, Jesus isn't saying, don't you remember how much I've done for you? You know, I I did that whole dying on the cross thing, remember? And I love you so much. Can't you do something in return for me? Can't you, like, do this whole church thing? Right, you know, I've already done the dying on the cross thing. The least you can do is do this whole reading the Bible thing. But that's not what God is saying. He's not keeping score like that. Where he's saying, I've done this for you, right? Remember, Remember all the things that I've done for you? Right? You should do something for me. And, and, and really, what, what breaks my heart and what really breaks God's heart is that this is what some of us think that he is saying. And if that's what you think, then you've misunderstood Christ. You've misunderstood him. You've missed the point. And, and the thing that's really tragic is that some of you feel this way because you've been inundated with this form of teaching and this form of instruction your whole life. Where you have, uh, where, where you have parents, and I'm not, I'm not bashing parents, right? It's a difficult job, I guess. Um, haven't been there. But some of you have parents, and, and, and for me, um, you know, my, my, my mom, uh, and, and for some of you, I uh, would say something along the lines of, you know, I've done so much for you, right? Why can't you do something for me, right? You know, I, I, I have fed you, I have clothed you, I have sheltered you, I have paid for everything. Why can't you do the dishes? Why can't you try harder at school? Why can't you get your act together? Why can't you pull your weight? You owe me. And for some of you, that doesn't just happen in the household. It happens with your relationships, with your friendships. It happens in your romantic relationships. And that's tragic. It's tragic. That's tragic. Because you've been so beaten down with the feelings of guilt that when you hear God's commands, you cannot think of anything other than God saying to you, you owe me. You owe me. And if that's what you are hearing, you need healing. And healing comes only from experiencing the pure, untainted love from the only pure and untainted person. And that person is Jesus, who out of love for you has given everything. And beloved, today, today, you need to know that Jesus loves you. And Jesus has demonstrated his love for you in this, that while you had nothing to offer him, he gave everything for you. When we're questioning why we should persist in our obedience to him, we are called to remember what he's done for us, not so that we will be guilted into obeying, but rather that we will remember that his commands for us flow from the same heart of love that drove him to the cross. And when you ask, why should I obey? God reminds you that he is your loving father whose great desire is to bless and protect his child. And I just want you to think for a moment. You know, and I want you to ask yourselves rhetorically, why do parents give instruction to their children? Why? 
You know, why, why do parents tell us to look both ways before we cross the street? Why do parents tell us to eat our vegetables? Why do parents tell us uh, to sleep early? Why do parents tell us to get plenty of exercise? Why do they tell us to do our homework? They don't tell us these things to oppress us, but to bless and to prosper us. Right? And that's the heart of God. It's the heart of God. And he's calling us to remember what he's done for us so that we will know his heart and that we will know that his commandments are for our blessing and for our protection. And he's so explicit about this in our passage. If you look at verse 24, Verse 24 says, The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. And a more literal translation of this, if you were actually just take the Hebrew and read it straight up, it would read this, it would read like this. The Lord has decreed for us to fear God for our good always. The Lord has decreed for us to fear God for our good always. Always. And if we break down our passage, God is simply calling the Israelites to remind one another that he loves them and that he is always out for their good. And the good that comes out of obedience is found in verses, uh, in verse 25. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. The good thing that God has in store for the Israelites was righteousness. Now, um, to have righteousness means to be uh, means to belong in a covenant. And so the prize of obedience was a covenant relationship with God. Now, we need to be clear because uh, otherwise um, you would think that there is some contradiction here. Moses is not saying that the Israelites had to be sinless in order to be in the covenant. He said that the whole law needed to be kept. Now, for those who break the law and sin against God, there is a provision within the law for the forgiveness of sin. In fact, uh, these provisions are written in the first chapters of Leviticus. And I don't know how many of you guys have actually looked at Leviticus. Leviticus is just chapters of rules and laws and commands. And, And guess how... It start, for those of you who haven't read it, guess how it starts. Look, I know you're going to screw up. And so when you screw up, this is what you need to do. I mean, God is really practical. It's almost like he knows us or something. And what he says is, I have a list of commands, you know, obey them and you'll be a part of the family. But, if, but, but I know you are going to disobey, but that doesn't mean you're kicked out of the family. Right? There is a way to gain forgiveness. And that's through confession, repentance, and the sacrificial system. See, whenever someone sinned, they would confess their sin and repent to God and then sacrifice an animal as a payment for their sin. And once a year, the chief priest would go and he would sacrifice a goat as as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the nations of Israel. And the reason why sacrifice was necessary is found in Hebrews 9.22. The law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Sin was punishable by death, and the blood of the goat was necessary for the forgiveness of the nation of Israel. Now we know that this act was a foreshadow of the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ, whose blood was shed for the sins of the world so that whomever would believe in him would receive forgiveness for sin and would not perish but have life and life into eternity. And so the first step of obedience is to acknowledge that we are sinners and that we need a savior, and that Jesus wasn't just a man that died, he was the God-man who died for you. And for those of you who have done that, this is your ultimate act of obedience. 
and your reward is a relationship with Jesus Christ that will stretch into eternity. And for those of us who have received Jesus Christ, so I'm talking to Christians for a little bit, you've taken the first steps of obedience, which is faith in God and receiving Christ. And so for you, for us, the reward for persisting in obedience, the reward for continuing in obedience, the reward for the, the, the answer to the question, why should I obey? The reward is more intimacy with Christ. In James chapter 4, verse 8, it says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Obedience allows Christ to draw near to us where we will experience the comfort of his love, the fellowship with him, his tenderness and compassion. That's Philippians 2 verse 1. And you've heard me say this before, there is absolutely nothing in this world better than Jesus Christ. There is no greater reward in this world than knowing Jesus. And the only reward that's greater than knowing Jesus is to know him more. And not only do we get Jesus, not only do we get more Jesus, but we gain a new life purpose, which is the glory of God. And we work for the glory of God by engaging in the work of bringing about the salvation of the lost and the sanctification of the saints, or to put it in terms that we are more familiar with, to engage in the work of evangelism and to engage in the work of discipleship. And as we engage in these activities, God will lead us on an adventure filled with meaning and purpose, and you will be able to look back at your life and say, I did not waste it. So not only is the reward Christ, but the reward is renewed life where there is meaning and purpose. And um, my friend gave me this quote from Francis Chan this week, and I, I just, I, I treasure it. Um, and what, what, what uh, Pastor Francis Chan said was this, um, our greatest fear should not be a failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Our greatest fear should not, be, um, should not be failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. And life with Jesus guarantees that we will be working at things in life that matter and that we will be avoiding things that do not. My life's goal is to be really, really, really bad at video games. That's my life goal. My life ambition is to be terrible at video games. Right? I want to be able to play somebody and have them beat me like, you know, 20 to 2. Right? My life's goal and my life's ambition is to be really, really, really bad at stuff that does not matter. To not know things that do not matter. And our life's ambition to be really good at things that do matter. At things that stretch into eternity. The reward for obedience is a vibrant, exciting relationship with Jesus Christ where we not only experience the depths of his love, but we engage in life. But we engage in life where we are not just existing, but we are engaging in life. And I want to give you guys a moment now because we, we've said so much, right? I, but, but before we finish up this sermon, I, I want to just give you guys an opportunity to respond to this. Because I, I know that some of you in here have misunderstood Christ your whole life, right? And I know that you think that Jesus is a distant God who is simply trying to burden you with more things to do 
And, and, I, and, and my prayer and the prayer over the last um, couple of weeks has been that um, this passage and that God's word would help you to see that this is the farthest thing from the truth, that God is not looking to oppress you with his rules, but he is looking to free you. He is looking to bless you. And so for those of you who have, um, who have thought your whole lives or for a good chunk of your life that God is simply trying to guilt you into obeying, or that you or, or that you need to do this just because what you need to be reminded of today is the cross and that the same heart that drove Christ to the cross is the same heart that is issuing each and every commandment whether it be the simple ones like reading your Bibles and spending time with them and enjoying God to the harder ones. Like engaging people with the gospel and giving away your stuff so that those around the world can know the gospel, can know Jesus Christ. Every command is rooted in the fact that God loves you and that no command that he gives you is for your oppression or for your harm, but every command has been given you for your freedom. And for you, if you have, if this is news to you, I want you guys to just take a moment and just, you know, just um, just bow your heads and to ask God for forgiveness and to just tell him that you have misunderstood him and ask for the Holy Spirit to bring healing to your heart and to help you to see Christ as you ought, as the one who loves you without reservation. And if you are not a Christian today and you have come here, I would like you to take a moment and just to reflect on Jesus' love for you and on what he has done for you. And my prayer is that you would receive his invitation because the invitation has now been extended to you. to receive his love, to know him, to receive forgiveness for sin. And if you do, it'll be the best decision of your life because really there is absolutely nothing in this world that's better than Jesus. I want to give you guys a moment to do that and then I want to um, just pray for you guys and then we'll uh, wrap up the sermon. Christ Jesus, we love you. We just love you, God. You know, we're so sorry for how all the times and all the times that we have misunderstood your heart. You know, God, it must be so frustrating to be God because you love us so much and every single time we look at what you're doing for us, we, we don't see your heart and we just feel oppression because of, you know, the sin that has been afflicted against us. And God, we apologize for um, having um, sinned against you, for having misunderstood um, you, and for having missed your goodness and your mercy. And Father, we ask, um, we, we, we pray for uh, one another, we pray for ourselves, asking God that you would bring about healing by your spirit in our hearts, God, that we would no longer see you as this, um, as this 
authoritarian God who is just trying to oppress us with commands, but that you, O God, have given us these commands for life and life in abundance. And Father, we pray for on those of us here today who just don't, who don't know you and who don't know how good you are. And we ask, God, that um, the words that were just spoken would, um, would, 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 would bring about a reality in their hearts, spirit, that you would be working in their hearts, that you would help them to see that, yes, God, you are God, you are alive, there is eternity. Um, eternity, um, eternity is for everybody. Heaven is only for those who have received you, Christ. And we pray for them, asking that you would just speak to them, touch them, help them to see truth, that you love them so and that life with you is better than life without you. And we pray these things in your beautiful name, Christ. Amen. Uh, I have seven minutes uh, now to do uh, application. Um, this, uh, this whole passage um, is a warning um, that our sinful tendency is uh, to degenerate Christianity uh, from a vibrant relationship with Christ into a list of do's and don'ts. And not only is this a product of our sin nature, but this is um, work that Satan is actively involved in. See, uh, Satan's goal is to get you to think of Christianity as, you know, these are the things I need to do, uh, these are the things I I cannot do, rather than looking to Christ and looking at how much he loves us and how much we desire him. And if we focus on what we are only, if we only focus on what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do, then what we'll end up with is we'll end up with empty religion. And my fear is that for some of you, you have allowed Satan to run rampant in your life. And you have taken your eyes off of Christ. and have missed the beauty and the love that flows from him. And instead, you're fixated upon, you know, these are the things I need to do to be a better person. These are the things I need to do to get right with God. These are the things I need to do. These are the things I need to do. I need to avoid this. I need to avoid that. And you're missing the point, which is Christ. And so, I feel like a broken record, but for those of you who are there, if you are experiencing cold and empty religion where affections for Christ are low or non-existent, then please take to heart this application, which is to remember Jesus Christ, to look to him and to learn and to relearn that he loves you. And, and, and that's, that, that, that's it. I, I don't want us to look at this and to think, you know, this book tells me what I'm supposed to do. Rather, I want you to see that this book is God's word for me to show me how much he loves me and what he has in store for the world. And if we look at this book And we see that this is the book through which God will tell you that he loves you. If you are missing that, then this is where you go. This is where you go to learn that Christ loves you. There is nowhere else to look. And I am begging you to not look at this primarily as what I'm supposed to do, but rather look at this as who is God and to learn and relearn Christ. And we learn and relearn Christ by coming to this word and by coming to the written word of God and and just seeking and praying for the spirit to make to to strike our hearts with a glimpse of this reality 
And I beg you to do this every day because you are at war against rulers and principalities. Every day you are at war. And the stakes are your souls. Your soul. And Satan will try to steal you away and to steal your glimpse away from Jesus. And so the call for you, the application for you, is to learn daily, learn and relearn the goodness of Jesus Christ. Who is God? Who is God? You know, I do this every day. And I pray this for you every day that you would learn and relearn Christ. And we don't just do this on our own, but in community and for parents. This is your duty to make sure that your children learn that Jesus loves them. Right? That's why family devotions are so important. That's why children's ministry um, is looking at um, giving you guys children devotionals to teach your children not, not to teach your children what to do and what not to do but to teach your children about God and that Jesus loves them. And and I touched on this earlier, but as a warning, parents, please be careful on how you instruct your children on why they should obey you. Because I'm not a parent. All right, I think, I think I already put my cards out on the table. Um, and so far be it from me to instruct you on how to teach your children, but simply take the warning from the text. If you tell them that they should obey because they owe you, then that's what they're going to think about Jesus. However, if you ask them to trust that you love them and that obedience is for their good, then this is how they are going to understand Jesus and his commands. So that is a word for parents. And Deuteronomy 6 is addressing the family unit, but um, we as church family are not excused from this word and from this command and from uh, this exhortation because we have also been given the command to teach one another and to learn together in community. Right? In Titus 2, it talks about older women teaching the younger women, older men teaching the younger men. In Colossians 3.16, it talks about how we are to teach one another. And so we also have the job and the task of teaching one another. And that's why belonging to church family is so important, because it's a place for us to learn Christ together so that we will not fall to the deception of the evil one. And so if you're not plugged into church family, um, Get, get plugged in. Get plugged in. Right? Um, there, there, there's a welcome table downstairs. Um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll happily um, you know, plug you into the appropriate um, small group or uh, university or high school fellowship. Uh, get, get plugged in because it's in these small groups and in these fellowships where um, you remind one another of the beauty and the goodness of Christ. And... And for those of us who are already in small group, who are already in fellowship, understand that fellowship in small groups are opportunities for us to preach the gospel to one another. Your attendance matters because you have been given a task to preach the gospel to one another. It is not about going and taking. It is about going and taking and giving so that you can bless and be blessed and that you can participate in growing your church body. We go to small group and we go to fellowship and we get plugged into church family so that we can learn the beauty and the goodness of Christ from one another through the reading and studying of the word, through singing. And the goal and the hope is that, and the reason why um, the focus has not been on what you need to do and rather on know that God loves you. 